Sure. Yep. Hi guys, uh, welcome to the, the Snowflake lecture uh, for 445, 645. Uh, we're super excited today because we have an old friend of ours, uh, Bo A. Chen, who was, uh, you were ISR, or what, what, run again, what master's program are you in? SES. The... Okay. Uh, anyway, so he, he, he did his master's, he, he worked on, a, he was in my research group, spent a lot of time working on our query optimizer, uh, and he was immediately hired by Snowflake, and he'd been there since then. Uh, so we also brought, brought along uh, friends Libo and Commander, also from uh, Snowflake, and they've also been there for a long time. So this lecture is basically an overview of what the Snowflake system looks like. And what you'll see is they'll connect a lot of the pieces that we've talked about throughout the semester uh, and the different components of a database system. We've seen how you actually build it in like a cloud native architecture and specifically designed for OLAP systems. So hopefully I'll like not look crazy because all the things I said during the semester uh, these guys will say, oh, yeah, this is a big problem. This, this matters a lot. Here's how we solved it. So with that, uh, guys, take it away. And of course, in, in the class, uh, if you have any questions, just you click on the, the raise your hand icon and I'll I'll interrupt them and we can fire away and do this at any time. Okay? All right, go for it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll just get started. Uh, I'm Boe from Snowflake. And today we're going to uh, get a little bit of an uh, overview of Snowflake's architecture and do some mini deep dive in uh, the cloud storage compute layer and as well as the cloud uh, cloud service layer and also uh, workload optimization. Uh, okay, so yeah, we're we're in the time where you know more and more uh, large organizations. Uh, start to move from uh, on-prem softwares to cloud-based solutions as the you know cloud-based solutions have uh, following up advantages. So first of all, they're elastic, uh, meaning that you only need to provision resources when you need to. And also this, um, you, you get the uh, scalability uh, and you know you can scale uh, compute resources uh, uh, independent of, uh, for example, storage resources. Um, and also, uh, when softwares are built in the cloud, uh, they can be built as a service um, that is always on and always up to date uh, with the latest um, release. And also, uh, last but not least, um, we uh, cloud solutions provide an ecosystem for our customers to meet and exchange valuable information as there is no um, physical barriers. And yeah, database architecture uh, when migrating to the cloud also uh, needs to uh, rethink their architectures. Uh, so firstly, like most of the lar uh, last generation on-prem large scale data processing systems are designed with the philosophy of pushing compute to the storage. And these uh, architectures, they have uh, challenges when migrating to the cloud. And Snowflake was the uh, first to build a data presence system with a cloud native architecture. And there was, we, we started building Snowflake uh, around 2012. And now Snowflake runs on all three uh, public cloud providers. And yeah, let's uh, look at Snowflake's architecture. So the Snowflake storage layer uses um, cloud blob storage, uh, for example, AWS S3 uh, for its usability, availability, and durability. And the compute layer, which we uh, which is also known as virtual warehouses, uh, uses the uh, cloud compute instances. Uh, for example, uh, AWS EC2 instances uh, for their uh, scalability, uh, meaning that uh, you can, you know, scale your, uh, for example, the size, um, the number of workers in a virtual warehouse um, to a, a decent enough large number. And, and also for its like uh, scalability, uh, sorry, performance isolation, meaning that workload runs on one warehouse do not um, interfere with workloads run on other uh, virtual warehouses. 
and also for its elasticity. Uh, our customers can usually create or resize their warehouse uh, in seconds. And the cloud service layer um, is responsible for uh, interacting with the uh, um, client and also um, the metadata service and query optimizer and uh, also uh, managing transactions and so on. And also we build uh, data sharing and a lot of other cool features in the cloud services layer. So next I'll uh, uh, touch on the software development uh, philosophy uh, a little bit. So firstly, uh, simplicity. Uh, this means that uh, we Snowflake uh, generally does not expose tuning ops to, uh, to customers unnecessarily. And most of our optimizations are, um, when, when we implement them, we uh, design them in a way that they can gen generally be applied to our customer workloads without any side effects. And adaptivity is also um, a pretty important philosophy. Uh, so th this means that, you know, uh, query execution uh, tries not to make assumptions based on optimizer statistics. And, you know, when we implement features, we try to consider uh, a lot of these uh, extreme scenarios uh, that could affect performance drastically and, you know, come up with designs that uh, are more uh, stable in during execution. And also... Oh, yeah. Let me just interject real quick in the class. That that under adaptivity, which says query execution tries not to make assumptions based on optimized statistics. So what they're that basically means is that they're not trying to do the cost-based query optimization that we talked about before in class, that they are going to make a good guess about what they think the query plan should be, but then while they actually run the query, then they make decisions. So like there's uh, a different way to think about query optimization. Uh, I guess right now we we, we still do cost based optimization, right? but not so, for everything, right? Like there's like some of the, the push down the like aggregation stuff. You do that, you figure that out while it's running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some optimizations when when possible, we try to you know defer it to execution time to make the decision. Right. Whereas like in the class, we teach it about like you try to generate the entire query plan all at once, then run it, and then if even if you're wrong, you don't change. So there's a different way to think about you know, doing query plan. Sorry, yeah, we, yeah, we we still kind of generate the query plan all at once, but like the execution layer ha has the uh, up, uh, has the uh, kind of capability of making decision, kind of changing strategies during execution. I guess yeah. there, there's ongoing projects that allows us to maybe, you know, uh, re uh, kind of rewrite the query plan during execution and so on, but we're not there yet currently. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, lastly, the, we, we want to provide a platform as a data cloud that uh, has the uh, functionality of an of uh, a lot of components. Uh, for example, an enterprise level uh, per, uh, analytical database, as well as data pipeline, data lake, streaming, transaction, and uh, transactional database, and so on. Uh, and yeah, the query engine uh, is the center, centerpiece that powers all of these components. When we add these new uh, kind of components to a system, we build them on top of our um, query engine when possible. And a lot of these components can share some code, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I'll... I'll talk a little bit about the cloud storage and compute. And, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to kind of, uh, hand, hand over to Commander to talk about cloud services and Libo will talk about uh, workload optimization. So let's first get to cloud storage. So micro partitions, they are uh, immutable columnar files for data storage uh, on, you know, cloud storages. They are usually of tens of uh, megabytes each. And uh, they are commoner, meaning that data in each column are grouped together. And there's a file header, as you can see in the diagram. Uh, and the file header stores the region of each column. Uh, 
uh, and when when we download the file, we first download the ha uh, file header to figure out uh, where each uh, column uh, are, and and then based on the query, we we can skip the download of non-selected columns, and also column metadata uh, of each file or micro partition is generated when these micro partitions are written. Uh, these metadata includes um, min max values, number of distinct values, and so on. And they are used for uh, data pruning, which means that uh, during compilation or execution, we 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 can, uh, based on the actual data, we, we look at the metadata of each file and decide that we can uh, skip the download of certain files. And this avoids unnecessary file download, uh, network IO. And when the files are on, when our files are on, you know, remote storages, uh, this uh, skipping IO based on uh, data pruning is really essential for query performance. Uh, yeah, let's move on to the query execution layer. So Snowflake's crush, uh, query execution engine is a columnar, meaning that uh, data of the same column is grouped together when possible, uh, when they are flowing through the uh, query execution engine. Uh, this allows effective use of CPU caches, uh, CMD instructions, and compression schemes. And uh, the query execution engine is vectorized. Uh, each operator handles batches of you know, a few thousands of rows in the common format. This avoids uh, full materialization and improves uh, cache efficiency. And, uh, and, and we also use a push-based uh, execution model, uh, which means that uh, operators, you know, push results to the downstream uh, uh, as opposed to, you know, pulling results from the upstream operators. So data is also processed in a pipeline fashion, meaning that you know we uh, the control flow transfer in a way that uh, it always try to send data to the downstream uh, whenever possible without materializing everything, and this enables uh, the efficient processing of uh, deck shape plans in addition to tree shape plans because like for example in the deck shape plan you can have a split. And then with the push-based uh, query execution model, you can just, let's say, transfer the data to, to each branch of the downstream, um, which, it, which can be done uh, relatively easily. So Bo, I don't know if you can say this, talk about this. In the class, somebody asked, us once, asked me once, like, why don't we, why don't databases use GPU, GPUs more, right? Because they have a ton of little you know, cores, they run a lot of threads, they can be vectorized. Has Snowflake considered this and, and decided it was a bad idea? And if so, why? Uh, right now, we haven't we haven't started looking into GPU yet. We are aware of it, but it's, yeah, I, like from what I've seen, I I think that GPU is suitable for some tasks. They're pretty fast on that type of task. For example, you know, evaluate a bunch of simple uh, expressions and so on, but like. Our, our workload are mostly really like complex. They consist of like uh, CPU CPU intensive uh, CPU intensive parts and also IO intensive parts. And I guess right now CPU is still uh, CPU based uh, instances are still kind of the dominant solution or the best solutions we we found so far. We've been looking at FPGA, but yeah, also yeah, we they're they're, they're pretty kind of limited to certain scenarios. Awesome, thanks. Okay. All right, so yeah, let's look at the, let's look at a mini query as an example uh, for how Snowflake, you know, uh, data engine works. Uh, so this query um, computes, uh, selects the uh, name and the text, which, is computed as a uh, salary multiplied by a flat rate from all the employee who's more than 25 years old. So the first step is 
uh, in the table scan, uh, as you can see in the diagram, we um, download from the remote files and also decomp uh, decompress from the remote files into three columns, uh, age, name, and salary. And the data of the same column is grouped together, as you can see, and the data is also produced and sent to the next operators in small batches. So let's say we download the first file and then we decompress it, we extract the first, um, let's say 4K rows from, from it in, in, three, uh, in three columns. And then we pass these three columns to the next operators. Uh, ne uh, the next operator is filter, which is res uh, responsible for um, evaluating this age um, greater than 25 filter and produces a selection vector, which indicates the row indexes that qualify the filter. Uh, since you know data in the age column is grouped together, uh, this ex this simple expression can be evaluated using uh, SIMD instructions to be more efficient. And when uh, the the next step then is to evaluate the expression in the projection. Uh, that computes, namely the expression that computes the uh, the the tax. So, um, notice that we have a selection vector at this point. Uh, we only evaluate for the indexes uh, that are selected. Uh, and yeah, and and finally we uh, produce the final results. Um, the final result uh, is represented as the name and the text column and plus uh, the selection. And then after one iteration of this processing is done, we uh, the control flow transfer back to the scan to get the next batch of uh, columns uh, and so on. Okay, so yeah. Uh, in, in this slide, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, you know, major components in the execution layer and how we make certain, you know, design decisions. Um, so the table scan is is a pretty uh, essential um, operator. And, you know, almost all queries have a table scan because they need to uh, kind of get input from uh, either remote or local storages. Um, so the table scan is responsible for downloading from uh, storages and uh, decompress and provide uh, provide the inputs to other uh, operators. So, um, firstly, you know files are distributed among a set of workers using consistent hashing. This is to minimize uh, file move movement. If, for example, uh, we resize a warehouse and so on and uh, these uh, uh, workers or cloud instances if they finish early they can steal files from others and also these files are cached on the local disk for later queries to reuse to prevent like from for example repeatedly downloading remote files and join is another really like essential piece in the query execution layer. Um, Snowflake implement uh, distributed hash join um, algorithm with runtime adaptive distribution method selection. This means that uh, based on the uh, runtime statistics, we can choose from how we want to actually implement the distributed hash join. And also we, uh, as, a, as a byproduct of building uh, of of processing the build side of the uh, join, we we also build bloom vectors and, and maintain value ranges uh, for for the keys for effective uh, runtime data pruning, and also uh, you know join skill is sometimes a, a like a problem we have seen a lot in during execution, so we implement auto uh, automatic skill detection and mitigation. Meaning that, uh, meaning that if there's a hotkey, uh, then we can, you know, 
either it's on the build side or the probe side of the joint, kind of we we can automatically detect it and mitigate it by kind of um, distributing it to different uh, different workers to handle. And also, lastly, uh, uh, the scheduling operate of operators. This means that how we run, uh, how how we how we schedule different operators in in the same query. Um, so mostly we do um, pipeline pipeline wise lockstep execution. Uh, this means that uh, all workers uh, work on the same uh, work on the same execution pipeline until they are all done, and then they move to the next one. This exploit uh, intra uh, operator parallelism um, and for plan fragments with not much data that can be uh, they we we identify them and they can be uh, scheduled on single nodes in parallel uh, to avoid let's say uh, scheduling overhead for 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 all workers and thus exploiting uh, interoperator parallelism Okay. Oh, wait, about, like, have you guys managed memory on a compute node, right? Like, is, is there a traditional buffer pool where you're like, you're fetching in something from S3, you, 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 you bring it into memory, and then if it gets evicted, you're evicting it to uh, the local, like the, the local cache, right? Like, it's, and then there's like another hierarchy that says, all right, evict from local cache and just drop it. It's like, does, like, it's more complicated than a traditional buffer pool running in a share, shared everything single node system. But it, there's still, you guys are still managing memory yourself, correct? Yeah, we're still managing memories, uh, memory ourselves. We have uh, buffer pools and so on, and yeah, uh, mem memory manager um, management system. And uh, during you know extreme scenarios, we we can spill to local disk. And if the there's no uh, no space left in the local disk for us to spill, we can also spill to remote disk and you know read them back uh, later. Right. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, these are all the slides uh, that I that I have. Uh, I'll uh, hand over to Kavinder to talk about the cloud services layer. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Kavinder. Uh, I've been Snowflake for a couple of years now, and I'll talk about the cloud services layer. Next slide. Uh, yeah. So we can think of the cloud services as sort of the brains of Snowflake. Um, it is the kind of the single layer that is the coordinator between the client, the metadata compilation, warehouses, and the cloud provider itself. Um, and so it's acts as sort of the coordinator, but it's kind of a lot more interesting than just um, kind of a middle end. Um, and the cloud services layer is designed to be a general purpose layer so without parameters to expose to customers. So in traditional systems, uh, the, the equivalent of a cloud services layer would have a lot of configurations and you can configure it specifically for your workloads and you can change those configurations as your workloads change. For instance, if you're running ET ETL at night and you're running online processing during the day, you can kind of set up the system differently. Uh, but Snowflake doesn't expose any of those things, as Bowie mentioned, as part of our kind of philosophy around simplicity. So um, it makes the challenge harder on our end um, in terms of engineering, because the cloud services layer has to be kind of everything to everyone. Um, so kind of some responsibilities that fall to this cloud services layer, this isn't kind of a comprehensive list, sort of the interesting things. Um, one is service management, so keeping the entire service of Snowflake up. Uh, metadata and concurrency control, uh, query compilation, including kind of parsing, optimization, query planning. Uh, security, so both security at the, at the cloud service level in terms of authenticating users uh, and ensuring kind of everyone is has an, every account is siloed from one another, but also kind of the traditional uh, database security concepts of kind of roles and access policies and things like that. Um, background services uh, are run by the cloud services layer and as well as kind of cloud infrastructure to ensure that we have kind of uh, enough VMs available for to scale up or to release VMs when we want to scale down. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll talk about kind of the different tracks. Uh, I'll talk less about the things I don't know too much about and more about the stuff I do know about. So um, service management, uh, you can kind of think of it as how do you keep a, a, a cloud system up? And it's a, a challenging problem for us because uh, Snowflake across all of its deployments handles billions of queries a day, uh, billions of statements a day. Um, and in the cloud services layer is the only multi-tenant system um, or portion of the system. Uh, meaning that any customer or multiple customers are going through the same cloud services node uh, for their workloads. And they customers run different types of workloads. Um, and this isn't strictly just OLTP, OLAP. You know, customers have 
uh, very bursty workloads or kind of very long running queries. Um, and that how that plays out on an entire database system kind of has different properties. And we have we have to be aware of that and kind of uh, handle that. Um, the service also must be kind of fault term tolerant and auto scaling, right? So we don't, because we don't expose anything to customers, uh, they can't ask us for a new node. They can't ask us uh, to add a kind of prepare. We can, they can't indicate to us that they're about to kind of hit us with a bunch of queries and kind of tell us to scale up. There's none of those facilities. So uh, the service must be able to uh, be resilient in, in the face of that. Um, so some interesting challenges um, within the service management area is um, ensuring that no one customer overloads the system. So this kind of falls into the bucket of auto scaling. So if you have a multi-tenant system and one customer decides that they have a conference running and they're running demos and they have like 5,000 people uh, issuing SQL or Snowflake queries at the same time, um, we don't know which necessarily cloud service node that will go to and we don't kind of uh, pin a customer uh, to a specific node in most cases. So uh, we have to be able to scale up so that no other customer kind of is affected by that. Um, we also have to ensure that uh, failed nodes and jobs are retried. So this is both an uh, aspect of fault tolerance. So if a, during the worker in execution of a, of a job, if a worker fails or single node fails, we have to be resilient to that. Uh, but moreover, in terms of self-healing, as we release features, um, every customer is on the newest version of Snowflake. So um, it makes it challenging when we release features. So we have kind of mechanisms in place so that we retry with uh, new features disabled. And so to the customer, it seems like their, their queries are just succeeding, but in the background, there may be failures and things like that, that we can kind of mask over. Um, I think providing predictable performance, especially at the cloud services layer is a challenge because um, compilation is just one aspect of the cloud services layer. There's a lot more that goes on um, and having to compete for resources in a multi-tenant system makes uh, providing predictable performance uh, for customers a challenge, uh, and some customers don't care necessarily about how much time they have their statements spend in cloud services, but others have customers are very sensitive. And we can't really separate those two customers from the same node. Um, and then finally, ensuring enough cloud VMs are, are available. So this is kind of, we keep a, we have mechanisms in place to kind of keep a free pool of um, VMs available. Um, and the challenge is not reserving too many VMs, but not reserving not enough VMs so that you can scale up, but you're not, Snowflake isn't wasting too much money and kind of holding on to VMs that never get used. Uh, next slide. Uh, so metadata, um, I think compared to like the traditional database system that you'd read about in textbook, um, I think Snowflake is, a, its use of metadata is kind of unique and or interesting. I mean, it's not necessarily unique across all new systems, but kind of compared to the textbook stuff, it is pretty interesting and good to know. Um, it's, so it's metadata- the right way to do it. Uh, how about that? The way you guys do it is the right way to yeah. do it. Well, yeah, yeah. And I think I think it comes with kind of being cloud native and stuff like that. So it's a nice fallout of the design decisions made early on. Um, and so, as Bowie mentioned, we create uh, metadata files for every um, data file partition. And those metadata files, we have uh, good enough stats on every single column. So customers don't need to tell us, hey, build an index on this column. We pull all this in metadata for all columns, um, regardless of how wide the table is or how many tables a customer has. And <clears throat> we generate a ton of metadata files, and there's a lot of metadata interaction going on all the time um, with every kind of statement that gets processed. Uh, so we decided to use a different statement, a different uh, database entirely to store metadata and use FoundationDB, which is a open source key value distributed store uh, with acid properties. Not too much of an expert on FDB, but um, this is kind of like the, the underpinning of all of our metadata. And every single metadata um, database object is stored in FDB. So beyond just tables and columns, um, users, roles, masking policies, uh, views, schemas, it's all stored in FDB. And it's partitioned in a way that the key itself is um, si silos every customer's data from one another in, in terms of metadata, uh, because we use kind of the out account as the top level key. Um, so there's no way for like uh, us to inadvertently pull metadata from a different customer while processing um, another customer's globe. Um And cloud services layer retrieves the metadata at different at different times um, during compilation. So we don't just reach out to FTB once. We kind of have different phases of compilation or different phases of the cloud services layer in, in general. And we make different calls to FTB. Um, and similarly, uh, or in a different way, uh, back, the background services that the cloud services run um, are managed in the FTP layer so that we don't have a kind of a growth of F metadata that gets too large. We kind of compact the metadata, um, you clean up old data and stale data. So kind of we have those in the background to keep it reasonably sized. 
Uh, so below is in the diagram of kind of how we interact with FDB. It's a very simple example, but imagine you have a cloud services layer and you're processing a query. Um, as you go through that query, you kind of want it, you want different metadata. So initially you want table metadata to verify that tables exist and the properties of those tables. Uh, then we, as we get to pruning, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, we want to get column level, com column level metadata. So we then reach out to FDB again. And then finally, uh, if you have like a DDL or DML statement, then uh, FDB is the place where we can kind of just issue this, issue the create table statement and kind of pr persist that data. But then we also use FDB to grab locks on tables. Um, and this is, yeah, this, we can go to the next slide. Cool. So um, <clears throat> concurrency and control. Um, so the fact that we use S3 or like the, the blob storages and we have immutable files uh, makes kind of snapshot isolation and multi-version concurrency control the, the natural choice. Um, because every DML operation, whether it's an insert, delete, or update, generates new data files. And we can consider the set of data files uh, before and after um, the DML operation as this entirely different version of the table. Um, so it works very nicely for us, um, where when we uh, process a query, we get the version um, based on kind of the current state of the table, and we use that version uh, moving forward. So if there are other operations going on in the system, um, the, the query that's being processed is kind of unaware of those, and it doesn't. There's no competition for um, grabbing a kind of table level off or anything. You you, you have your version, uh, and you stick with your version. So if you have a DML op operation on a version, then you have the lock for that version. But um, if you're just a select, you kind of you don't see reads that are uncommitted, or you don't see reads that are outside of your version. Um, and, and additionally, kind of this versioning feature, which I think kind of is understated or maybe doesn't get talked about enough in, in textbooks, is that uh, if you have this versioning and you have a, a cloud system, it makes things like time travel an easy feature to implement, right? If you are at version three in this diagram below and you want to go back two versions, um, we support that because we have the properties of S3 that give us kind of uh, the, the fail safe of the data, the retention of uh, old data files. So even if the data is deleted from the customer's perspective, it still is, is an S3 for a certain amount of time. And within that amount of time, we can do time travel. So if you mess up a table and you want to clone your whole database, you can uh, clone based on some previous time. And, and what that does is it doesn't copy any data. It doesn't do kind of any, any uh, data copies or data loads. It just simply points the new database and new schema to an older version and those files all exist and we just register that now we have an active database that's uh, re referring those referring to those files um similarly result reuse is also kind of a, a simple um, enough feature to implement because uh we use the tables version as kind of a, a hash uh, as part of the hash when we generate um, a hash for the entire kind of query and uh, columns and all of that to figure out if we can use a previous result um, that's already been executed. So in those cases, if you if you haven't changed the table or nothing's changed, and we've already computed, we already run a very long query, like an hours long query, uh, we can and you run it again, we can just give you the result because nothing's changed. And we can detect that nothing's changed because we have this version system. How how aggressive are you guys are like the or sophisticated is your query result caching? Is it like exact SQL query matching, or can you like uh, you know, recognize the semantics of the query and, and, and exploit that? Uh, it's it's more in the in the realm of exact query matching. Like you can make slight differences, but it's pretty much like the top level result is what it's yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, next slide. Okay, now I'll talk about query compilation for a couple slides. Um, so this is the general flow of query compilation. Um, also, you can call it optimization and query planning. Um, and it's kind of it kind of fits your standard textbook model with some slight variants. Uh, so we start with the query text on the top left. Uh, <clears throat> we go through parsing to generate an abstract syntax tree. <clears throat> we then go through semantic analysis where we look up um, tables, columns, information. We verify that kind of the, 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 the SQL query makes sense. Um, and we also do type checking. Uh, one interesting thing about Snowflake is that because we have the metadata and because that metadata gives us min-max values, we can indicate to um, the execution engine the specific kind of width of um, data types to use. So this is a, is a, is a, may seem like a small optimization, but it kind of has, in aggregate, it can kind of save uh, execution engine a lot of memory by not wasting um, uh, unused <clears throat> memory for data and execution. Um, then we go through a phase of logical rewrites. Uh, these are rewrites primarily on the parse tree itself. Um, and then we go through pruning. Um, so pruning is the process in which we look at predicates in a query, and then we prune out data files by pruning out uh, micropartitions. 
And <clears throat> this is a is a huge kind of the cornerstone of Snowflake, I would say, is this pruning um, and how we leverage it. Um, so then from pruning, we go to natural plan generation, we go through a kind of a standard set of heuristic based rewrite rules. Um, and as the the dashed lines indicate, um, when we run these rewrite rules, we also have new opportunities for pruning. For, for instance, if you push a filter down uh, from a join to the one or both sides of a join, and it's now sitting in your table scan, now you have a new opportunity to prune um, data files in that table scan. So that's why kind of the, the lines are indicated in both places. Uh, then we go through cost-based optimization. So we have a cascade style um, cost-based optimizer, um, nothing kind of different from what you what you may have read in the textbooks or been presented in your lectures. Um, and then finally, we go through physical We covered cover cascades in the advanced class. What's that? We covered cascades in the advanced class. Oh, okay, okay. Well, check out the YouTube video then. Um, and then finally, uh, we go through physical plan generation and regenerate a plan, which is then shipped off to the execution engine. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> okay, um, so rather than talk about like the details of query compilation, I would first say that like the stuff you've learned in this class is very relevant to database systems. So it's not old stuff. It's not outdated. It's it's very relevant. And the better you know that, kind of the better of, you can get up to speed with modern systems. Um, so I'm going to talk instead about kind of the things that I think are interesting that Snowflake does that many other systems don't do, or that traditional systems don't do. Um, so one whole realm, well, realm of that is data dependent optimizations or kind of metadata dependent optimizations. So I've talked about pruning. I'll talk more about that later. Constant folding is another optimization where um, if you can detect that a column will always have the same value, you can substitute that column um, with a constant and you save um, execution time, you save having, you save IO, not having to read that column. Um, and you can also, that constant folding itself can unlock new opportunities for optimization. Um, and then constant file detection. So if you look at number one there, uh, number one is a value set and not a table scan because at some point the compiler was able to detect that, uh, hey, all the call, all the data files that are remaining for this table scan all have the same values for all their columns. So I'm just going to substitute this table scan with a uh, constant set of values. Um, so that's one interesting optimization we have based on the metadata. Um, and then as Bowie mentioned, we have many uh, adaptive features. Um, and so these are <clears throat> uh, optimizations where the planner um, or the, the query plan kind of indicates to XP that, hey, you can make a decision um, and it doesn't give a fixed, fixed plan, but the plan is there and XP kind of adapts. So one is join filters, which um, based on like, if you look at number two there, that join filter corresponds to the topmost join. Um, and what it does is it, because we kind of, implement a, ha a hash join, we have a hash build and that build side kind of once you've done built the hash table, you have um, the, you have the information on what columns you've seen, what their min max values are, what kind of the ranges are. And so before you even get to the join and join probe from the other side, you can do an early phase of filtering um, and you can aggressively push that filtering down um, in many cases to as close to the, the source of the data as possible. So uh, the benefit of this is that if you've built your hash table and um, you know the, the min max values and those statistics that kind of the compiler just didn't, couldn't possibly uh, have or didn't have correctly, uh, by having a join filter, you can kind of eliminate many rows, even at the table scan level before they go through kind of many other ex potentially expensive operations. Um, you can you can filter for that as well or no? Uh, yeah, it's a bloom, implemented as a bloom filter. Got awesome thanks. Yeah. Um, aggregation placement is another one where uh, aggregate aggregates can be expensive. Um, a big, the two things the aggregates can uh, be uh, evaluated in, in different places uh, legally, and some places it's obviously illegal to move an aggregate to. But because we exploit the fact that an aggregate can be um, evaluated in different places, and the cost of an aggregate can change depending on where it's evaluated. So. We kind of, from the compiler perspective, we just assume that, hey, we don't know enough um, about the, the stats of this uh, query to say that, hey, this is the exact place to um, execute this aggregate. So we indicate to XP or the execution engine that uh, we're allowing you to either evaluate this aggregate earlier or later, depending on kind of the cardinality you're seeing of the rows. Um, so in this case, with number three, uh, the aggregate can either be evaluated before a join, um, which makes sense when, you, when the join is explosive. Um, but it can also be evaluated after the join, which makes sense in the other case where the join is reductive. Um, and we kind of allow ex the execution engine to figure that out. And then finally, adaptive links is another interesting kind of smaller uh, adaptive optimization where um, in, in many cases, you'll either uh, in a distributed system, you'll want to redistribute your data amongst your workers, or you may want to keep that data local to the same worker that you're on. 
Um, and adaptive links allows the execution engine to determine what to do based on the, the data set, the, kind of the cardinality of the data it's seeing. And sometimes it makes sense to broadcast your data set to all of the workers. Sometimes it makes sense just to hash it and distribute it to a single, distribute the hash data to a single worker. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll talk about pruning more um, because, yeah, this is, I think it's a cool feature. Um, so I'll go through the example. Uh, and let's say we have a query like select star from foo uh, where C1 is greater than five. And on the left hand side, you have your data files uh, for foo. Um, and I'm showing you the call, the min max values for C1. Uh, so as you can see, there are two uh, files that don't uh, fall into the range of um, being greater than five. Um, and so as part of the pruning pass, what we do is we take these predicate expressions and we break them down into kind of, kind of atomic level uh, uh, expressions that we can prune on. And then we prune the data files and we do multiple passes of this for every predicate expression. So after we run one pass of this, we've already eliminated the two of the five data files. If there are other predicates, it may reduce this further. Um, and this is this feature is kind of it's it scales nicely to the complexity of the query. So maybe it doesn't really seem like we're saving that much time and that much kind of IO by eliminating two files. But when you have massive queries um, that are kind of tens of thousands of lines long and, and reference hundreds of tables, uh, we can do this granular pruning um, on every table on every pruning expression that we kind of can have access to in terms of being close to the table scan, um, and we can have a huge reduction in. Um, uh, the data files that we end up actually scanning in execution. Uh, next slide. And then along those lines, um, with enough pruning, you can kind of unfold the opportunity for constant folding, and constant folding itself can lead to further optimization. So if you look at a query like this, where we have uh, we're projecting a single column from foo, uh, but before we project that, we join it with bar um, on C1 equals bar dot C2, and then we're looking for um, all, all rows of bar where C2 is less than four. Uh, so as we prune first on bar, um, we've eliminated four of the five data files and we're left with one. And we can detect that that one file is constant. So the min max values of C2 in that file, regardless of how many rows it has, is always, is it will be two. Um, so that lets us substitute two for um, bar.c2. And effectively, we can rewrite the entire query to selecting a single column from foo and having a constant filter uh, on foo. And um, perhaps... We can then now now this unlocks a new opportunity to uh, prune on foo based on this predicate, and perhaps it will even lead to like an uh, entire constant folding of the system entire query where we detect that hey even foo dot c one equals two leads to like a constant set of data files, and then we can just return the result without even having to execute it um, at all. So those are and that happens in some cases, but kind of the, in the average case we can do kind of interesting optimizations like this. Um, so kind of pruning and constant folding were things that I wasn't aware of how powerful they could be before I joined Snowflake, having seen other systems. Um, so I, yeah, I can't highlight it enough in terms of how much we leverage this, this kind of, these kind of optimizations. Can you say like roughly percentage what queries can, can leverage this? Is it like 10%? Uh, this sort of uh, optimization, like with constant folding, yeah, I would pro probably in the 10% bucket, but I think pruning uh, and it having a dramatic impact on queries, I would say is probably, I don't know, like, 75, 75 to one hundred percent of queries that actually execute have like will benefit from pruning. Of course, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and, and it's sort of like scale. This, you know, ten percent is still a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, this sort of like advertisement for compilation at uh, Snowflake. Um, so these are kind of interesting problems that I think we that we work on, um, and I and yeah, just uh, I'll go through them. Um, so one is compilation time. So obviously, like you can run many optimizations, and you can kind of search this your search space of potential plans uh, all day. Um, but then, if you spend too much time there, then you never return a result to the customer. You return a result way beyond their expectation. So. A compilation is always a balancing act between figuring out how much time we spend in optimization um, and at what that benefit will be on execution time. And at what point do we say, hey, we have a good enough plan, we've done enough pruning, um, let's just execute this execute this plan as is. And this is kind of an ongoing uh, challenge that we face. Um, I think core optimizations is another area because Snowflake is relatively young compared to other systems. And so there are a lot of optimizations that we don't have um, in the in the optimizer, core optimizer itself. Um, and it's not so much implementing these optimizations. I think understanding what to implement and how to implement it is fairly straightforward as, as there's tons of, of academic 
papers on it and kind of textbook information and it's very easy to understand are we very old the challenge for us is because we pin customers every customer is on the latest version of snowflake and we don't pin customers to older versions and we don't let them set any knobs or disable optimizations um, we have to kind of figure out a way of how to release an optimization to all customers without regression. And when you're kind of running billions of queries a day um, and you don't really, and different types of workloads, uh, almost as a rule, at least one customer will find a regression with every optimization, regardless of how beneficial that optimization is for all other customers. So um, this is an interesting challenge kind of from a software engineering perspective. Um, adaptive <laughs> optimizations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've said this a couple of times that other, the class may not like, appreciate it. The idea that you guys are only running one version of this of this database system for all customers is a huge, huge deal. Like with Oracle, for example, when you download Oracle, included inside of it is, is also like the query optimizer, the query planner uh, from like the last 10, 15 years. And you can go and manually set, like I want to run, you know, Oracle 19, but use the optimizer from Oracle 10 because of these regressions. So that means that and the Oracle software, they have to maintain like 10, 15 year old versions of software for all these old customers that don't want to, you know, don't want to upgrade. So for you guys, you don't have this problem. You say you force everyone to do it, but of course you have to be cautious to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Then this is a big, big deal. And because of the cloud, you can do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, and it's in and so in terms of like engineering within uh, the engineering culture is kind of very um very concerned about this um, and so we do have a lot of mechanisms in place we have a ton of testing tools and i don't think we could do this like it all goes hand in hand with the cloud like because we manage the service and we can observe the query workloads that also makes it kind of realistic for us to be able to then uh, put everyone on the same version with all the same optimizations um adaptive optimizations is an area that we can are continually growing in I, I feel like our adaptive optimizations are just scratching the surface so kind of there are a lot of things that kind of you can consider uh optimizing a query and running a query is kind of a joint phase and do re-optimization and things like that i think there's a lot of literature on that um similarly kind of runtime pruning is another uh, area where because the cloud services layer is all done on one node maybe we can distribute pruning and have pruning passes that get done in execution so uh, there are a lot of kind of areas of exploration here and then finally um optimizing non-olap workloads snowflake was designed as kind of an olap system to begin with and there are many assumptions you make especially within the compiler uh, when you have that especially how how free you can be with memory and how loose you can be on compilation time but as we get new workloads uh, like oltp style workloads or um external functions or kind of data science snowpark um spark like workloads uh the expectations of customers change kind of the data patterns change how they access their data how frequently they issue queries all change and and our objective is to have one one compiler one optimizer for all workloads and figure out how to be like smart and intelligent internally without having to ask the customers to tell us hey what workload are you planning to run um yeah and i find a kind of external functions i find very interesting because uh, this is a, literally just like a java or python sandbox that gets stuck into an operator uh, at execution time and we don't really have it's kind of a black box from the a stats perspective um so kind of being adaptive or being more intelligent there is kind of an area that we, we still need to explore uh, so i taught we taught, we taught uds on thursday last week what percentage yeah. of the queries are using uds external functions do you know roughly uh, it's probably in the in the low single digits right now. Um, UDFs in general um, is is very uh, like a, there's a wide usage of like SQL UDFs, but the external function UDFs is kind of we're slowly adopting people like that. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I think this is my last slide. Hey. Uh, so uh, it's my part right now. So. Uh, I'm Libo from Snowflake's SQL workload optimization team, and I've been there for uh, a few years right now. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, workload optimization. So Boe and Kavinder, they just gave a, like, uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, Boe, can you uh, restart the slideshow and make some updates? Yeah, so uh, Boe and Kavinder just gave a talk about overview of uh, compute, uh, and cloud services layer. And I'm going to uh, do more of a like deep dive in one of our latest features and uh, um, just a showcase of how Snowflake can benefit from this uh, unique uh, architecture. So um, 
So basically, uh, what does workload optimization do? So uh, we own a bunch of uh, separate features um, that benefit the performance and cost of uh, not customer queries, not single queries, but customer workloads. Uh, so uh, some of these features include uh, clustering, um, which is, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, this class knows what clustering is. Uh, so um, <clears throat> basically clustering is uh, what uh, makes pruning, uh, as Kavinder mentioned earlier, much more efficient. And uh, we also have materialized views. Uh, so uh, materialized views are like very simple if there's no DML, you just, you know, cache the result. But uh, unfortunately, that's not the case in real world. Um, so uh, we um, we take care of the uh, new uh, new data, new uh, micro partitions and deleted micro partitions by like constantly uh, like doing main like incremental maintenance on top of the materialized views. And we uh, keep the materialized view uh, fresh uh, from the customer's uh, perspective by like uh, doing some uh, runtime, uh, uh, doing some runtime rewrite uh, for the customer. So for example, if the customer selects from a materialized view, uh, so, uh, Basically, their result will come from two different places. The first place is the materialized view itself. And the second place is like uh, for the for like the new data uh, or new updates uh, on the base table that's not yet uh, materialized. Uh, those will directly come from the base table. And we do a combination of those results, uh, those two parts together so that uh, from a customer's point of view, the materialized view is always fresh. And uh, in terms of in terms of maintenance, because of the like constant DMLs uh, on the materialized views, we uh, on a base table, so uh, we cannot just materialize uh, like everything uh, because that way, like incremental uh, maintenance would be very expensive. Instead, what what we materialize is like. Uh, like partial uh like partial materialized views uh can think of as a materialized view on like uh, different micro partitions on base table and uh so uh in like each uh each row in the materialized view itself comes from like one uh at most one data file uh in the in the base table so uh and then uh when like querying the materialized views, uh, we do like further aggregation on top of it. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, the whole challenge comes from constant DMLs on the base table. And uh, we also own features like result reuse, uh, yeah, which is currently just caching uh, like the, the result and using uh, exact match to uh, to 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 get them. <clears throat> And the feature, uh, the latest feature I'm going to talk about today is uh, our query acceleration service. So uh, more details to come. Um, so yeah, so some of these features like are uh, kicking in automatically, like result reuse uh, and query acceleration service if the customer opts in. Uh, but some other features like clustering, materialized views, uh, uh, today they have to define uh, to be like uh, set up by customers. Like customer has to uh, set up clustering keys on the table. They have to manually create materialized views. Um, so one of our long term visions is to uh, implement uh, like automatic re recommendation or even like automatic adoption of uh, those features. Uh, so it's like a workload. Uh, that um, that learns about itself and uh, optimizes itself. Okay, so now more details about query acceleration. Next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, what problem uh, are we trying to solve with query acceleration service? Uh, I know the name uh, feels like it's uh, like a super effective thing, just accelerates everything. Uh, but uh, um, we are all like, uh, we all know some database stuff. 
we know it's not possible to just accelerate everything. Uh, instead, uh, the problem we are trying to solve is very uh, is like in a limited area, but uh, very um, has a very big impact on query performance. So, um, so there are like two uh, separate perspectives. Uh, one is like uh, we have a heterogeneous workload with uh, both large and small queries running on the same virtual warehouse. So um, yeah, so like if you have such a workload, um, yeah, so some some problems may arise like uh, uh, larger queries, they might uh, have a long execution time and like while the larger queries are being executed, uh, the smaller queries might queue up because uh, the large query takes up all resources. Uh, there are several solutions to that. Uh, the customer could uh, spin up a larger warehouse, um, but uh, like when there's no uh, real large queries, uh, that incurs like uh, unnecessary extra cost for the customer. Um, and you know, customers because uh, it's real money, they are sensitive about it. And uh, they could also spin up multi-cluster warehouse, which is uh, you know uh, basically. Uh, spin up like uh like uh copies duplicates uh of the virtual warehouse and uh so uh, for example if you have a like a small warehouse which uh contains two servers you could uh make this multi cluster so uh there might be multiple clusters of two warehouses uh, two servers and uh each cluster takes care of uh like each query is executed in uh, at, at most one of those clusters. Uh, so uh, this doesn't solve everything because, as I just said, uh, a query cannot be uh, executed on multiple clusters. So uh, the the execution time of those large queries are still high. Okay. So the next perspective is uh, the warehouse size has to be decided by human right now uh, or like uh, some customer has to deal with it. So uh, it's not able to scale um, based on the actual compute demand of each individual query. So uh, the traditional model requires the customer have some knowledge of the workload, uh, like how much compute uh, their workload is gonna, be, gonna need. Um, yeah, so... Um, um the customer estimation is not always uh accurate um and that might like either cause small uh, slow performance or like uh extra cost to them yeah so uh speaking of those large queries uh in many cases uh like large table scan is like a culprit um like when uh the customer query scans like terabytes of files. Uh, the table scan can take a lot of time, uh, and we we do see a lot of such queries uh, in real life. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, yeah, given all the problems, uh, here is like uh, what we are trying to do. So basically, um. The basic idea of query acceleration is to execute a fragment, a part of the plan at a larger scale. Um, so um, basically uh, we are taking a, we are taking like a, a fragment of the query plan and execute it on like additional separate servers uh, outside of the main uh, virtual warehouse, the main server cluster. So, um, and like uh, those fragments, uh, the servers can, for those fragments, the servers can come and go. And uh, like, there are like some uh, target uh, like criteria uh, when selecting the fragments. So first uh, it needs a large table scan. So uh, otherwise it doesn't make sense to uh, really to, to, to scale this up and uh, does isn't worth all the overhead we have. So, uh, and second, uh, we need uh, like fragments with high reduction ratio. It means like a lot of data comes in from a scan 
and uh, only like a small amount of data comes out. Uh, so the high reduction ratio can come from like a highly selective filter or highly selective join filter uh, or bloom filter in Snowflake's case, or like uh, a group by with a very uh, low cardinality uh, such stuff. So the reason behind that uh, uh, is explained later. Uh, and uh, the third one, the third criteria is that no uh, data exchange between servers should happen in those fragments. Uh, so that's because like, uh, well, in, in the normal warehouse execution, uh, we have those other servers uh, talking to each other. Uh, we establish a mesh and uh, that mesh uh, actually uh, kind of limits like how many servers there can be. Um, you don't want like too many servers talking to to each other, broadcasting stuff. Uh, that's going to add a huge overhead. So uh, because like uh, for query acceleration, we want to we want to have many many servers. Uh, so uh, like one criteria is node exchange. So uh, every everything has to be local until the very last step of the fragment. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this uh, diagram um, basically shows how we uh, execute, uh, how we do the plan rewrite and execute everything. So, um, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want some uh, extra servers. So where those extra servers come from, they come from the thing we call flexible compute. So, uh, Basically, they are extremely scalable. Uh, so um, you can grab like a, a very large amount of servers uh, compared to your the size of your warehouse. Uh, and uh, the server assignment is also flexible. Uh, that's where the name comes from. So uh, the servers can come and go uh, at any time. So uh, like this server can work on this job for uh, like this amount of time. And then uh, like maybe something changes, maybe uh, there's not enough servers in the system, or maybe like there are other jobs that uh, need the servers more. Well, they can just uh, stop working on the current job uh, like uh, without interfering with other servers on that job and then uh, join another like uh, job or like uh, be like repurposed anyway. Um, so uh, that's about flexible compute. Uh, and um, we have this design principle called do no harm. Um, so basically, uh, this means um, the query execution time with query acceleration should not be less than, uh, should not be more than like if query acceleration didn't kick in. So uh, anyway, uh, in other words, query acceleration shouldn't make queries slower. And okay, so here is how we do the rewrite. So basically we, uh, because of the do no harm principle, um, um, we are actually sc uh, scheduling the fragment work on both the warehouse and flexible compute servers. So, uh, in, in that case, like even if you get no flexible compute servers, the warehouse the, the warehouse is still working on the the job uh, and shouldn't be uh, much slower than as if uh, query acceleration hadn't kicked in. So um, yeah, so uh, we have this um, <clears throat> uh, the, on the warehouse. We uh, we also work on this uh, this stuff and. Uh, we on the uh, on the flexible compute fragments, uh, we execute uh, all those stuff, and we insert the intermediate results into what we call materialized result files. Uh, so they are just like uh, internal results materialized as regular data files, and uh, then the intermediate results are sent uh, are like uh, sent to the to the warehouse servers uh, through cloud storage uh, like S three. And they're scanned by the warehouse, and the rest of the work continues on the warehouse. Okay, uh, so there is like one possibility for those materialized results, uh, although the lifetime of those materialized results 
uh, currently is only like the lifetime of the single query, but uh, um, many of you might have noticed like uh, this uh, intermediate results can potentially be reused and that would be a huge benefit uh, for a customer workflows. Okay, next slide, please. So I just point out also too to the class that like, this is another advantage of using shared disk, right? You can't do this easily if you share nothing because to, 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 to borrow a new compute node, you'd have to move data to it first, right? And then, then you start using it. But, but if it's shared disk, you say, all right, spin up a new compute node, it's stateless, and it starts pulling from S3 to, to scale out, you know, for, for this, you know, the, the, the shaded portion of the query plan here. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing to mention is that uh, it's about join filters. Uh, so as you can, you, you might see like the bloom filter is also part of the fragment. So uh, the way we implement this is like basically uh, during during the join build stage, uh, we serialize all the bloom vectors and from the hash join build node, and we upload them to S3. Uh, and then uh, the flexible compute services uh, servers can just come and download it from S3 as needed. So next slide. So uh, next step, uh, I'm gonna talk about like how the query execution uh, works. So uh, one like uh, one key uh, characteristic of query acceleration is that uh, the files are uh, from that for that table scan are distributed uh, in a different manner. So normally uh, the files for scanning are like determined and distributed during compilation time. Uh, there could be things like file stealing, but uh, the, the the main shape uh, of the file distribution is determined at compile time. And uh, in query acceleration, we use this continuous scan set thing. So uh, files are distributed in batches and runtime upon request. So like a server uh, runs out of files to scan, so it goes to uh, the the service. Uh, we call it like query coordinator. The server would go to query coordinator, asks for uh, another batch, and uh, continue like processing the other batch. And this keeps going, keeps uh, going and going, and uh, until the, the entire uh, like file queue is exhausted. So um, yeah, so for query uh, execution, uh, we first create this continuous scan set from the input files. Uh, and uh, this scan set is created uh, after like some runtime pruning and some other optimization. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, and then the warehouse server uh, begins uh, requesting those batches for scanning. Uh, and uh, we have something called a warehouse sampling. So um, basically the warehouse part, the warehouse branch of the query plan uh, gets executed first and it sends the statistics to the query coordinator and the query coordinator could then determine, okay, uh, is this fragment, uh, does this fragment have a high reduction ratio? Uh, is it like a, a lot of enough work to spin up a uh, query acceleration, et cetera? So, uh, the query coordinator will answer those questions from the, the stats collected by the warehouse servers. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so once the warehouse sampling passes, uh, the flexible compute uh, actually kicks in. So uh, the flexible compute servers uh, are assigned uh, to like to the job and uh, begin requesting batches from the shared queue. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, once uh, once uh, a batch is requested uh, from the queue, it's put into a staging area. So a uh, staging area contains like all the batches that are kind of uh, on the fly. Um, and uh, so like after flexible compute like processes one batch, uh, 
it registers uh, the batch uh, as materialized result files uh, to the query coordinator and the query coordinator just puts them in another materialized result queue. Uh, and um, the and upon file registration, um, like a checkpoint uh, is performed. Uh, so basically uh, the that batch is marked as done uh, in the, and removed from the staging area. So next slide. Yeah, and uh, so after like uh, like all the batches are are distributed uh, and processed, uh, ideally, uh, normally, um, like every batch uh, sh in the staging area should be uh, should be checkpointed and removed. Um, so this, I, if everything is right, the staging area should be empty. But uh, in case there is some uh, like random server failure or like, uh, you know, like with this number of servers, glitches do happen from time to time. Uh, we don't want to fail the entire query because, uh, you know, uh, queries accelerated can be uh, costly to run. So instead, uh, we take those batches from the staging area that are still there uh, and send them to the warehouse part for another chance uh, for a retry. So, uh, well, if the if the retry still fails, then uh, it's done. Uh, nothing we could do. Uh, but uh, in some, in many cases, uh, especially during uh, random server failure, the retry would succeed, and uh, we don't waste a lot of compute resources on those uh, glitches. So, uh, yeah. Next slide. Yeah, and the final step, final step is that a uh, warehouse fetches the materialized result files uh, um, and uh, does rest of the work. So uh, the main overhead just basically comes from the insert and scan of those materialized result files. That's the main reason we want the fragments to be highly uh, selective. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is an additional use case of like uh, of query acceleration. So uh, you know, for those normal select queries, um, we uh, compute the inter intermediate results in the fragments. But uh, for for certain insert or other DML queries, uh, the entire plan could uh, look like this. So uh, like from a table scan, a large one, a uh, bunch of, you know, uh, future projection or any any operator does, that doesn't require data exchange and uh, ends with an insert. So for such a plan, uh, as you could tell, uh, they can be, uh, the entirety of the plan could be accelerated directly. So uh, this provides like broader uh, eligibility uh, since you don't really need a reduction ratio to be high. So uh, they are inserted into the, the base table, uh, into the target table anyway. Uh, that's you know a, a benefit of using uh, shared storage, and uh, yeah, it makes some jobs like potentially serverless. Uh, this, uh, in particular, benefits uh, some of our, some of our like internal jobs, like materialized view maintenance. Uh, they could be uh, serverless and like use whatever compute is available. It doesn't require like a dedicated worker pool for it. Um, saves us some some a lot of cost, and it also be uh, for customers. Uh, it's also uh, uh, beneficial since like uh, this shape of query is actually um, you know uh, very uh, very common uh, in in real life workflows. Okay, so uh, that's everything. Uh, yeah, in my presentation, and that's everything. Okay, I will clap on behalf of you. Don't have to clap. <laughs> oh, God, man, the class. Uh, so we have six minutes for questions. Uh, anybody in the, I mean, I've asked a ton. Anybody in the class want to, want to go for it? So I guess one thing, I, you guys are doing the answer to this, but I, I think it's helpful for the, um, the students to hear this. 
uh, you know, Kavanda was talking about like query optimization or query compilation, how, how, you know, it, it was super hard and super important. Uh, if someone shows up at Snowflake and applies for a job and they have background in query optimization, uh, is that a, is that a, is that a huge win for the, for, you know, for, for a potential applicant? Uh, yeah, I think it, it helps to, um, to have that previous background. Um, I would say, yeah, um, having any sort of familiarity with databases would be helpful. I don't think we look specifically for the like, optimizer people to work on the compiler, but you have, if you have, you understand the concepts, it can help go a long way. Got it. And it's also worth mentioning too, I'm glad you, uh, Commander, you mentioned foundation DB, you guys basically have you know, teams working on two data systems. There's the Snowflake, obviously the Snowflake database itself. But then there's also a team that works with the foundation DB team at Apple. You guys are building a distributed OTP key value store uh, or maintaining it, which is a very interesting system as well. So, um, yeah. you know, Snowflake, you have, you have the opportunity to work on both types of systems and lots of, lots of problems. Super snake.